This is Bay 12. It's around 4 o'clock and we've just arrived in Tehran. This is our bus and we're getting ready to board. Is his name, and we're really very lucky to have Option. We've uh, we've known each other for uh, quite a number of years now, and uh, I don't want him to hear this because I don't want his head to swell. But he's quite a Renaissance man. Uh, he's lived in Japan, Holland, speaks some Japanese, and you'll see that his English is. He's, you can start to understand his English. He's, he's coming along fairly well with his English, and uh, but he knows. You know, it, he, to me, it's just, it, he brings theater and education and history all to every place we visit in Iran. And uh, you're in for a real treat. He's a very popular person, uh, so we're very lucky to get him. But uh, I think he knows that when we bring a special group from the USA, that uh, it will be worth dropping many things to do. So. In a few moments, we're going to let Option take over. Thanks for interceding for us. <laughs> Hello. 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 And welcome Hello. to Iran. Should I turn it on? Well, as uh, Jerry already introduced me, my name is Afshin. I have the pleasure to be your guide in Iran from today till the day that you leave our country. And I think my country is also very happy to have you as great uh, Americans in Iran and I'm sure that at the end of this trip you will have totally a different idea about Iran and Iranian. Uh, first of all I would like to talk about some of the tips about this country is the traffic and driving and crossing the streets, cars and motorcycles. That would be the most dangerous things in Iran. So, Please, wherever we go generally, we're, most of the time we're together, except the time that you have the free time to walk around and uh, experience everything by yourself. But especially where we are, where there are cars and motorcycles, they are very, very dangerous. Not just like they want to be dangerous. They do not, I mean, they just want to get where they want to go and they do not care about these things. So this is actually already one of the biggest problems in this country. The number of the people uh, <clears throat> having trouble on the roads here in Iran is the biggest in the world. So I want you, please, be very, very careful while you're crossing the street. Not all the red lights and green lights may work for the people. So you just cannot expect them to stop when they get to the zebra crossing. No, they don't do that. So just be careful about this. And the second thing would be actually, this is for ladies and gentlemen, for the dressing code which is, this is a, actually an Islamic country uh, ran by the people who set everything by the Islamic laws. So they expect all the ladies to be covered. They want them to have a head covering, like the scarf that you have, and they want you to be covered up to their wrist. And if you have something like a long shirt that can cover some parts of your hip, would be alright. For the tourists, they do not expect too much just to be totally covered like the Iranian people. Though, Later, some uh, you will see some of the Iranian girls who do not follow any of these things that I'm telling you. But anyway, they want to be different and do, to do something different. But generally, for uh, ladies, this is the, the very standard type of covering: a head covering, uh, the arms up to the wrist, and it's okay if, for example, you are not wearing socks, but make sure that you have got pants. I mean, it's not like you can walk with the skirts out. So, and for the gentlemen, uh, you can see I'm wearing like a short sleeve, this is okay. Or you can have a t-shirt, that's fine. But you cannot have shorts. This is not okay. But uh, if you don't want to put on some socks, that's fine, no problem. When we get to some places like, religious places like the shrines or places where some of these, you know, Muslim, you know, big people are buried. There, they require the ladies to put something called chador, which is overall covering, which generally at the door they will provide it. And then I'll teach you how to actually put it on. What else? Uh, about the money, as uh, Jerry said, I already was given some of these envelopes, which all uh, have something about 50 US dollar. And the rate was a little bit better than the rate that we had. 
at the airport, but you know that you know the exchange rates in Iran is very volatile, going up and down every day. Um, so don't be surprised if you get a price like this in this place and something else. Something. This is just uh, normal in here. This is one of our hobbies in this country. <laughs> every morning we wake up and say, "So, how much is dollar today?" And then we sometimes make joke and say that. By the way, how do people in America enjoy their life when they don't, they don't have these things? Every day they wake up and the price of the U.S. dollar is the same. And what a boring life. <laughs> for us, no, it's very fun. Every morning you so check the price for the euro and the U.S. dollar. So this is actually what happens in this country. And uh, I was asked about the water um, in the hotels, in the rooms. Generally in Iran, we drink from the water tap. It's okay, it's clean, already purified. There's one important place that we can see, and that will be the place that the last day in Tehran, we will go to the place itself, which is the shrine of Khomeini, the founder of the Islamic Revolution in 1979. And as I mentioned, we will visit the shrine itself later, we can get in. This is one of those places where ladies have to put on some chador as a sign of respect to this man. Um, generally, you should remember, if there is a place for the people to pray, which could be a mosque, a shrine, um, this is the place where women are required to have a chador. But if a mosque is a like, historical place for the visitor, then that's fine. Because if you have mosques, which now program like a mosque in Islam or other cities, these are visiting points which you do not have to put on chador or something. And uh, let me tell you something about Tehran because uh, this is your first time to come here. As I was warned before that whatever I say now, I should be careful I say the same thing the next time you come to Iran. So I must be very, very careful to tell you all the truth or whatever I know. Well, you have to check the next time when you come here to see if I said now is the same as what I'm going to say later. Uh, Tehran is the capital city of Iran. Uh, the population nowadays, according to the official, is something between 15 to 16 million people. But during the day, we have bigger number of the people traveling from other cities to Tehran for some of, you know, office works or uh, some businesses here. And during the night, uh, naturally, we have some less people. So we generally consider Tehran with a city with a population something between 18 to 20 million people. It's a very, very crowded city. and. Uh, it's located on the foot of the Elbors mountain range, which uh, today, because of the clouds, you cannot see the mountain range. It's right at the northern part. The highest point is 4,700 meters. Tehran itself is something around 1,200 meters above the sea level. Uh, we have snows. We always hope to have snows, because in the past 10 years, because of this global warming or other things, we didn't have enough snows here. So one of the biggest and the main problem in this country is the water. So probably the Third World War wouldn't be about money, terrorists, or things. It would be all about the water, I suppose. So this is one of the problems that we have here. But generally on the mountains we have snows and then uh, we have three main you know, ski resorts on the top. And then every year we have international competition as well. We also have American. Uh, snowboarders and skiers coming to Iran as well. I had the chance to be with three of these world champions from the U.S. And um, um, I can tell you, well, this is not something that the official tell you, but we have more than six to, I mean, something in between six to eight million cars in this city. So this makes it a real, like a moving parking. Everywhere you go, you see cars and cars. Today is Thursday, and in our calendar, Thursdays and Fridays are the weekends. So Saturday is the first day of the week. So we start working from Saturday, and we work until... Uh, schools are open until Wednesday evening, but some of the offices are also midday Thursday. And then they have one day and a half, or at most two days, holidays at the end. And Friday, as you know, is the day that in some... Um, not in some, but in all the cities. We have also Friday prayer, which is a special place where all these prayers go. There's a preacher, there's one person from the government gives a speech, and then they talk about different things. Generally, this happens in a mosque, but in some cities like Tehran, it also happens in the university, because they have more spaces, and this is a place where education things happens, 
and that speech is actually kind of you know educating and telling people what to do and how to behave or how to consider the matters about this country. Um, uh, not only Tehran is uh, the capital city, but also it's the most expensive city in Iran as well. So those people who live in Tehran generally uh, must make a lot of money to be able to uh, pay for all the bills, the housing, education, food and everything. So this is very natural that some people have got more than one job. They generally have two jobs. They work in an office until 4 o'clock, or until 4 o'clock, and then after that they have another job so that they can make enough money to be able to live in Tehran. Um, probably if I tell you how much the price of oil is, you would say it's very, very cheap. But it's according to our um, actually average income. Um, the oil for the normal cars is something around 35 cents per liter. So you can pay something at one dollar twenty cents per gallon as you use gallons in America uh, which I'm sure it's more expensive in the US almost half of the price that you pay for the gas but the thing is that the average income in this country is something around seven hundred US dollar seven to eight hundred it's not actually cannot set a you know a price for that but it's between seven to eight hundred US dollars is like an average uh, income which is paid by the official um, governmental offices to the people so if you get this amount of money and then you have to pay for the gas that would be not very cheap per, per, month? per month per month yes I wish it were per day <laughs> <laughs> but it's not <laughs> yeah, <three> million, so. <laughs> yes. well for those who have already changed we have some millionaires in this class <laughs> so uh, because uh, the exchange rate for one US dollar is about 30,000, around 30 <laughs> to 31,000 reals. And so if you just change 50 US dollar, you will be a millionaire. One and a half million Iranian money reals. As uh, the picture that you see on the money, it's the founder of our revolution, Imam Khomeini. Imam is the title, means the leader, and Khomeini is his last name which uh, a little bit further ahead you can see the golden domes of his shrine on the right side which is passed by and this is actually the official money that we use here generally we do not pay US dollar or other currencies for the things that we buy but for the tourists in some of the shopping touristic cities like uh, Shiraz or Isfahan maybe some of them accept US dollar the name of the money is real. Let me show you one. How much was that? Ten thousand. This is the this is the biggest uh, actually bank note we have. The picture that you see is, as I mentioned, this is Imam Khomeini, the founder of our revolution, nineteen seventy nine. The money, this is one hundred thousand reals. But remember, when you go out in the street and you want to buy something, if somebody tells you, for example, how much is this? You see, he says that it's 1,000. That 1,000 actually is in Toman. We have two names, real and Toman. So generally, people use the word Toman, and Toman has got one zero less. It means that it's more expensive 10 times. So remember that if you don't be misunderstood or just feel that they're cheating you. No, it's just the price is written on some of these things. If there's an R next to it, it means reals. But if there is no R, if there's T or nothing, that's generally Toman, which is uh, 10 times bigger than real. So you have to need, uh, you will have to add one more zero to the end to make it with the banknotes that you have. So if, uh, for example, if you want to pay for the, I've got a lot of, ch ah, this, this is what you meant, right? Yeah, this is, you may see something like this, or even bigger one that I have here. I've got a lot of money with me. This is one million real check, and this is half a million real check. But these are generally considered as checks rather than the bank. Mm -hmm. But because uh, we really need a lot of you know money for our daily life, so they also allow the people to use the checks without any problem. 
check, just like the bill. Just like the bill, yeah, there is absolutely no bill. So this is the entry to the city of Tehran. We have like a pay toll here. Uh, everyone is coming from the south, which is the next city here is Qom. We will drive the same way back on the last day when we get to Tehran again. And you can see now the domes of the shrine of Khomeini. Let me just go down so that it's... Uh, it's got four minutes on each side and there are also, but later we get closer, you can also see four blue domes. Those blue domes are the tombs of four great men who were his friends when he started the revolution and uh, guiding people toward the Islamic revolution in here. And these are the people who actually helped him and also who stayed with him. So now they are buried right next to him. His own son is also buried right next to him in the same place, under the main dome. Very big number of refugees from Afghanistan, Pakistan and Iraq. Most of these refugees are illegal refugees. They do not have, you know, the legal permission to work and stay in this country. As they do not have this permission, so they cannot find uh, a job here. So they just start selling things on the street. And like right actually, here? this year the government. Like right here. Is there anyone down there? Girl. She's oh, yeah. There she is, yes. You can see she's got something like a small uh, piercing on her nose, which generally she must be from Pakistan. Generally, the people from Pakistan. She's begging actually, you can see. It's a pity to see these people on the street, but we already have two and a half million people out of job in this country. So, the colors like green, red, black, and then we have our flag. Our flag has got three colors, green on the top, white in the middle, and red in the bottom. Uh, this is our national flag, but we have again, uh, flags which are completely green or completely red or black. If it's green, if you see on the top of a mosque you see a green flag, it only means representing the Prophet Muhammad. Solid green. Solid green. Nothing added to it. They might have some writing on them but no other colors. If you see a black flag, it's a sign of mourning and sadness. Maybe this would be the anniversary of one of these Imams or leaders of the Shia Muslims. If it's a red one, the red one uh, specifically refers to the third Imam of the Shia, which is Hussein. And there is a big celebration during the first month of the lunar calendar in Iran for Hussein and his friends who were killed 1,000, almost 300 years ago in Iraq by their enemy and because he was the son of Ali, the first Imam or leader of the Shia Muslims, we celebrated, and this is the same ceremony you might have seen in some countries but not in Iran, that people stop beating their backs with the chains or beating their chests with their hands, you know, parading on the streets, having drums, you know, singing, and this is all about that one. It's uh, considered as a sad ceremony, remembering that man and his friends uh, who were killed by their enemies. And he's actually the one we know as uh, like the leader who shows us how to live differently and stand against, you know, uh, the enemies or some someone who wants to uh, be against the religion or God. From 8 o'clock and it finishes about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. These are the, the hours that the offices are open in Iran and also the banks. They open at 8 o'clock in the morning and they close at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Generally 8 hours a day. Is, uh, today is Thursday, uh, the weekend. Probably some of these people are coming from the city of Qom, Qashan or Isfahan to come to Tehran to visit some of the relatives or just for shopping maybe. Actually we have shopping centers in every city. But just visiting friends. Some of them might also be going to the north over the mountains by the Caspian Sea. This is one of the very popular places that many people travel during the weekend because from Tehran to that, uh, to the north, 
the Caspian Sea. It's about three hours of drive, 250 kilometers. So many people would like to spend the two last days of the week by the sea in the north. There's, this is yeah, this is the shrine on the right side. You can see the shrine of Imam Khomeini, the leader and the founder of the revolution of Islamic revolution of Iran. Right next to it, farther to the west, which you cannot see from here, maybe you can only see the flags, you can see the green flags back there. This is the big cemetery and the main cemetery of Tehran, which most of the martyrs of the war, the soldiers who killed in the war, are also buried. The war between Iran and Iraq. Yes. Anywhere that you see a dome and a minaret, it means that you can pray there. Because it also functions as a mosque as well. So you can pray in a shrine, you can also pray in a mosque. But in the shrine, for sure, someone is buried. Why there is a minaret over there? Um, the minaret, it actually functions as like a, a very tall, um, how can I say, like a tall tower for someone to go to the top and call for the prayer from the old times. But the idea of the dome and the minaret uh, goes back to the time that the Muslims came to Iran from almost 1,400 years ago, the Arab invaded Iran and then from that time on, Iranian people become a Muslim as well. And then the early type of mosque that we had were just simple buildings because of the um, Arabs ruling this country, Iranian were not allowed to make big buildings or houses or you know mansions. They just had to make something simple until for almost 200 years. After they were pushed out of the country and some local uh, Iranian government uh, took their place, then Iranian started to create their own version of mosque, which now most in most of the countries, wherever you go, you see the same thing. Um, before Islam came to Iran, the last dynasty was known as the Sassanid. The Sassanid were known as the city makers, and dome was one of the first things that they created, the domes and the arches. So, if you want to have an idea how the palace of a Sassanid king looked, you can look at the mosque. A huge dome with a lot of space down there was the palace of the Sassanid. So, Iranian just thought that why not to make the house of a god like the shape of the house of a king, which is the biggest one. And then they said, okay, to make it more look like a mosque or place of prayer, we can consider the dome in the middle like the head and the minarets like the hands, upward praying. Mm -hmm. Generally in the Arab countries, there's only one dome and one minaret. But in Iran, I better say, in Shia countries, which Iran is actually the main and the only Shia countries in the world, which later I explained about the differences between the Shia and the Sunnis. Um, the, the, generally, the mosques always have either two minarets or four minarets. Four minarets to make it look like a dome, like a hand and two hands from each angle that you look at this place. This place. But for the Arabs, I mean, for the Arabs, I mean by, by the Arabs, I mean the Sunnis, because mainly the Arabs are the Sunnis. Their mosque have only one dome and one minaret. In our country, um, religion requires uh, all the mosques to play the sound, I mean, to play call of the prayer. But as a part of the culture, not everywhere you can hear that, especially early in the morning. In some cities, for example, like Isfahan, you may hear that. In Yazd, you may hear it. But in Tehran, rarely we hear the mosque playing you know this call of the prayer but at noon you will hear it and in the evening you can hear it. they don't want to wake everyone up in the morning maybe someone is not a muslim or uh, they're sick or their kids they don't want to wake everyone up so this is a part of you know respect to the people but in all arab countries or in sunni countries there is a big loud speaker and doesn't matter what time of the day five o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the afternoon, sunset or sunrise, there's always this call of the prayer. This is one of the differences between the culture of the Shia and the Sunnis. For your information, 95% of the Iranian population, which is about 75 million people living in Iran, 95% of these people are Shia Muslims. 
we also have Christians, Jewish people, Zoroastrians, who um, have their own temples, synagogues, fire temples, whatever, in this country, and they live freely here. There are some restrictions for some other, you know, uh, ideas in this country, which are very, those are like the minorities. And um, generally for the Christians, we have the churches, but most of these Christians are the Armenians. And they have their own type of uh, churches. In Isfahan, we will visit one of the very, very beautiful ones. Actually, you can see the most beautiful church in Iran from 17th century. You can also see the paintings and decoration inside. But in the other, other cities, just like Tehran, we also have churches, but they are like modern buildings. They do not look like you know, the churches that you see in Europe or other countries. They're like very modern buildings. Except there is one cross on the top that shows that this is a church. For the transportation in Tehran, we have the taxis. The, the taxis can come in green colors, yellow colors, and sometimes orange colors, which actually belong to different companies. We also have minibuses. There are small buses taking about 20 to 24 people. And we also have uh, regular buses. We also have uh, BRT, which is Bus Rapid Transfer. They have special lane that they can travel very fast from north to south, east to west. We also have the metro something around 300 kilometers of metro lines that we have it about five lines which the, the last station was next to the place that I mentioned which was opened last week and the taxis here are in two types or better say in three times some of them stand in some special stations and people get on the taxi and go to the end and get off there second one are those who call them and they can they can come to your door and pick you and then take you where you want to go. The third one are called the shared taxis. These are the taxis just driving around the city and anyone who just waves at them, they stop. They get on the bus, hop in, hop off, and then just go everywhere. So they are shared by four people. So this is uh, something that is not, I don't think you have it in the US. You don't have it? Are you have it now? Oh, so I just thought your life is as boring as before, right? No, so you have some shared tax. Your money is always the same, no change. Your taxes are just good. All right. No, we have a lot of fun here. Fighting with the driver. Why are you charging me too much? No, this is the money. Every day we have like this uh, game of fighting with the driver about the price and things like this. So this is something that happens in here. As I was talking about Tehran, uh, the location of Tehran is on the foot of the mountain range, al Bors mountain range, which actually divides the southern part of the country from the northern part. When you go to the other side of the mountain, you have all green areas. All the fruit, rice, and everything that can grow on land comes from the northern side. And when you go to the south, you come to the desert land. And it goes all the way back to Persian Gulf in the south. Well, actually, we have some green places where there are mountains and um, like snows. But the very green area is by the Caspian Sea in the north, which, which are the main uh, places where our rice and tea are grown, and also citrus fruit, like oranges. We also uh, grow most of the fruits, except some tropical fruits which do not grow here, like bananas or coconuts. The, most of the fruits that we use in our country, we grow it inside the country. We can say we're kind of, you know, self-sufficient. And, uh, well, this is the city of Tehran. Little by little, you can see the traffic on each side. And then, uh, uh, one thing very obvious in this city is that Every day, everywhere we can see buildings and houses being built. Older one being destroyed and then new ones coming up. That is, that is why the Tehran is growing day by day. Tehran has become the capital city for, we can say around 250 years, more or less. The, I mean, not necessarily as the capital city, but one of the places where the kings and the rulers stayed here because the northern part of Tehran, which is uh, 
um, rather greener because of the water we have from the snow and nice weather from the mountains in the old days. We had a lot of gardens and this water coming from the mountains was very very nice. So the people who traveled from the east going to the west they could have stopped here and enjoyed some of these gardens and the water and go to the west. If anybody wanted to go to the south again this was the center so it looks like like a crossroad to all parts of the country. So when first time some of these kings back to 200, 250 years ago, they found this nice place. They would like to have some uh, like palaces, mansions, or buildings here. And when the kings and the army were somewhere, many people started gathering here, making their own homes because they knew it was safe. So little by little, it grew up, and then finally, when it was officially the capital city of the country, for sure, many people, many more people came here and stayed here, and uh, more trades more uh, activities here so it made this city very famous so now the same story is going on but uh, one uh, one thing which is always mentioned to us and we are always warned about is the earthquake because Iran the whole country is on the line of the earthquake and one of the places is the city of Tehran especially because it's by the foot of the mountain so it's always this uh, possibility of earthquake here so they always tell people that listen Tehran might not be the safest place you can live in this country try to be a little bit farther away from it but when it's a political and economical capital of the country so for sure many people are attracted here and as a big city most of the facilities that you expect for a normal life like the movie theaters I don't know shopping centers uh, all the things that well many people are looking for can be found in Tehran. That's why Tehran is here. Well, you can see the city of Tehran right in front of you. Let me sit here so that you can see some more. Excuse my back. Flags that you see, these are nothing. I mean, not special meaning. These are just maybe for decoration. If you see the picture of people on the walls, these are mainly the picture of the soldiers killed in the war of Iran and Iraq during 1980 until 1988, eight years of war. Have you seen a significant change in climate recently? In Iran, you mean? Yes. Of course. We used to have a lot of uh, snow and rain all over the country. but. I can say, as far as I remember, at least in the past 20 years, um, I can give you another example. I remember when I went to school, at least every year we had 10 days off because of the snow. But now, every year, not even one single day. We may have our school closed because of the air pollution, one or two or three or four days during the year, but not because of the snow. This is uh, actually a very, very serious problem for Iranian because water is very, very rare in this country. And we have used a lot of water in this country and um, we should be very, very careful. About is climate water. change discussed here? Does the public is public aware? Well, we uh, every day on our TVs and newspapers, they always warn people, please make sure that you make the best out of the water. Do not waste it, because we do not have enough water. But it actually, in my opinion, we need actually more education from you know, children from school. In the school, we have to teach them how to take care of the water and the earth. Yes, of course. A range called our boards is starting from northwest of Iran, going all the way, crossing from west to east, going to Afghanistan and continuing up to China. So this mountain range actually divides the country in two parts. We have another mountain range which starts from northwest going all the way down to the south, continuing to the southeast and finally ending in the desert near the border of Pakistan, which actually that also divides the country if you another part on the western side. So all sides behind this mountain range on the western side and the northern side are the green areas. 
the whole area in the middle, they're all desert. So almost we can say 60% of Iranian land is desert. We have two huge desert. For your information, the hottest, the hottest spot on Earth is somewhere in the middle of the desert in Iran. And this was something which was um, actually measured by the NASA satellites. 79 degrees. Celsius. Celsius. Wow. So you can simply cook food. I mean, you can fry some eggs, boil some water, maybe in 79 degrees, which is very, very hot. So this may all the central part of the country, which tomorrow in the museum I will actually show you on the map how it looks. By the way, you said map, and remember that I have to give you the maps. We also have imported cars as well. And the imported cars are mainly from... That's okay, you don't need it on. Oh, really? No, okay. I'm, I haven't been using it. All right. So the imported cars are mainly from uh, South Korea, which are Kia Motors and Hyundai, and also Japan, like Nissan, Mazda, and also, especially in the past five years, we had a lot of Chinese cars. Yeah, this, uh, this is a new business that they have entered the car industries. Now we can say all produced in Iran. The 20 years ago they were all assembled, but now we make all parts. The only, the main part which is not produced here, probably the engine. The rest are all produced and made in Iran. So we have, uh, we can say four main car uh, making factories in Iran, which uh, they produced probably something half a million car per year, more or less, and the rest of the car are imported. But even for the imported cars, we have some restrictions. We cannot have cars here over 2,500 cc. 2,500 what? 2,500 cc, the, the capacity of the engine. It shouldn't be more than that. So generally, uh, we have uh, cars with four cylinders, and we cannot have cars from the US or England. We can have cars from Europe or Asia, Japanese, Korean, Chinese, um, German, French, Italian, but no American cars, no British cars. But my father has got an American car, American Caprice Classic, Chevrolet Caprice Classic, the police car. And it's old car, it's an old car, I mean, it's uh, at least 30 years old. And we asked him many times that you have to do something with this car. He said, I'm not going to do anything. I like that car. I keep it in the parking because I cannot get it out. Because of some you know, like traffic restriction, we must go through some uh, checking things, a lot of you know things, and then you cannot get it out. Which is, I like it. I, I'm happy when I look at it. So my father likes American cars. Do they allow women to drive? Sorry? Are, are women allowed to drive? <laughs> Well, we are allowed to do everything here except becoming a leader of the country, the judge, or sing and dance in public. Okay. These are the only things they cannot do. The rest they can do. Everything. Okay. They can even beat their husbands. <laughs> and they do. <laughs> they do. Not many of them, but some. I mean, people can do everything in their homes. For example, my mother is the leader of our family, but she cannot become the leader of the country. She can, she can even be a judge in our home to say who is right, who is wrong, but cannot be a judge in the court. Listen, everything for men and women are separated. We have stadiums for ladies and for men. So they can have like, you know, all types of sports, footballs, tennis, whatever. But they have separate, you know, um, places to do that. Uh, generally, um, for example, uh -huh, one thing, uh, generally when women are playing, for example, there is a match between two teams of only girls, I mean, uh, there are no men attendants, there are no men spectators, they're only for women. Khomeini, which is the founder of the revolution, the other one is Khamenei, which is the current leader of the revolution, which they have turbans, black turbans, and 
long beard so you can easily distinguish and generally there is something uh, written under their pictures which are words from them some messages from them for the people uh, for the pollution you mean yes from the in cars Tehran, they try to actually um, divide the cars in two groups of odd and even numbers so on odd days only cars with the odd numbers come out and on even days same numbers so this is uh, one of the main uh, steps they have taken to deal with the pollution. Second thing is that the central part of Iran is the restricted area which some cars with a special permit can get inside. These were the two uh, main things which were done to uh, actually deal with the pollution in Tehran. The thing which, was, uh, which is strictly checked by the police is that all the cars have, uh, especially private cars, have uh, the sign that shows that the car is fine and there is no problem with the emission and that there is nothing wrong with the car. So every every year all the cars must go to some certain point, some certain places where they give them these stickers to show that their car is okay and can be used in public. More than half of the population of Tehran, they own private cars. One of the reasons, especially when you see these small cars, this one, you see there is also a yellow sign on the top. These are the people, that these are their private cars, but they use it as a taxi as well. So they carry people, you know, places. And in this way, they can also make some money. That's the reason why many people buy cars, especially those who want to make some more money. They invest some money, they buy a car, especially these cars are, well, they're not cheap for those, you know, class of the society, but still they are cheapest cars in Iran, so many people can pay half of it and then later, little by little, on installment payment, they can pay the rest. Instead, they can use these cars. You can see many of them here, all these small cars. They are, as you can see, they are taking people, so they work as a taxi. And they make some money like that. Every day I wake up and say, okay, let's go and talk to some of these drivers about the price. How much are you going to charge me from here to there? 10,000. Oh, it's too much. <laughs> There's a special um, a plan in the city that they are trying to, you know, combine some of these big buildings together, buy the land or ask the owners to um, actually make a new building, but a high-rise one up to 10 or 15 stories. But some of them are old and some of these people do not want to lose their old houses. So that's why you see these buildings up to five stories. And generally for Tehran, they mainly allow the buildings to be up to five to, uh, from five to eight uh, stories, not more than that. If there are more than that, then they become like a commercial centers or huge buildings uh, for special purposes like offices or other things. Generally you can see buildings. And we also have in the new, I mean, in the rich residential areas, we have very high-rise buildings, which are very, very expensive with a lot of you know, facilities. They also know English, and they know that these people who come from other countries to Iran consider everyone as Iranian, because we almost look the same. The people of Iraq, the people of uh, Afghanistan, the people of Turkey, we more or less look the same. Not a very special sign on our face, for example, eagle nose or... <laughs> long ears, whatever, that shows that we are different. No, we're most the same. So they know English and they may say, oh, please let me take you, for example, somewhere. Or, uh, let's go and do something. I want to show you something. So that's why they tell you that do not get away from the groups, just for your own security. But if you just want to walk, the most important thing, thing to remember is the motorbikes and the cars, especially even, even when you're walking on the sidewalks, there are motorbikes. So you got to be careful. Very, very careful. This is our hotel.
This is dinner Thursday evening at the hotel. At the end of this trip, you will have totally a different idea about Iran and Iranian. Uh, first of all, I would like to talk about some of the tips about this country is the traffic and driving and crossing the streets, cars and motorcycles. That would be the most dangerous things in Iran. So, please, wherever we go generally, even most of the time we're together, except the time that you have the free time to walk around and uh, experience everything by yourself. But Especially when we are where there are cars and motorcycles, they are very, very dangerous. Not just like they want to be dangerous. They do not, I mean, they just want to get where they want to go and they do not care about these things. So this is actually already one of the biggest problems in this country. The number of the people uh, <clears throat> having trouble on the roads here in Iran is the biggest in the world. So I want you, please, be very, very careful while you're crossing the streets. Not all the red lights and green lights may work for the people. So you just cannot expect them to stop when they get to the zebra crossing. No, they don't do that. So just be careful about these things. And the second, this is not okay. But so if you don't want to put on some socks, that's fine. No problem. When we get to some places like religious places like the shrines or places where some of these, you know, Muslim, you know, big people are buried. There, they require the ladies to put something called chador, which is overall covering, which generally at the door they will provide it. And then I'll teach you how to actually put it on. What else? Uh, about the money, as uh, Jerry said, I already was given some of these envelopes, which all uh, have something about 50 US dollar. And the rate was a little bit better than the rate that we had at the airport. But you know that, you know, the exchange rate in Iran is very volatile, going up and down every day. Um, so don't be surprised if you get a price like this in this place and something else. Something. This is just uh, normal in here. This is one of our hobbies in this country. <laughs> every morning we wake up and say, so how much is dollar today? And then we sometimes make joke and say that, by the way, how do people in America enjoy their life when they don't, they don't have these things? Every day they wake up and the price of the US dollar is the same. And what? And Holland speaks some Japanese. And you'll see that his English is. You can start to understand his English. He's, 
he's coming along fairly well with his English. <laughs> and uh, but he knows, you know, it, he to me it's just uh, he brings theater and education and history all to every place we visit in Iran. And uh, you're in for a real treat. He's a very popular person, uh, so we're very lucky to get him. But uh, I think he knows that when we bring a special group from the USA, that uh, it will be worth dropping many things to do. So in a few moments, we're going to let Afshin take over. Thanks for interceding for us. <laughs> Hello. Hello. And welcome to Iran. Should I turn it on? Well, as uh, Jerry already introduced me, my name is Afshin. I have the pleasure to be your guide in Iran from today till the day that you leave our country. And I think my country is also very happy to have you as great uh, Americans in Iran. And then I'm sure that. This is May 12th, it's around 4 o'clock and we've just arrived in Tehran. This is our bus and we're getting ready to board. Afshin is his name and we're really very lucky to have Afshin. We've, uh, we've known each other for uh, quite a number of years now. <laughs> And uh, I don't want him to hear this because I don't want his head this well, but he's quite a renaissance man. Uh, he's lived in Japan. The thing would be actually, this is for ladies and gentlemen, for the dressing coat, which is, this is uh, actually an Islamic country uh, ran by the people who set everything by the Islamic laws. So they expect all the ladies to be covered. They want them to have a head covering, like the scarf that you have, and they want you to be covered up to your wrist. And if you have something like a long shirt that can cover some parts of your hip, it would be alright. For the tourists, they do not expect too much just to be totally covered like the Iranian people. Though, later some, uh, you will see some of the Iranian girls who do not follow any of these things that I'm telling you. But anyway, they want to be different and do, to do something different. But generally for uh, ladies, this is the, the very standard type of covering, a head covering. Uh, the arms up to the wrist and it's okay if for example you're not wearing socks but make sure that you have got pants I mean it's not like you can walk with the skirts out so and for the gentlemen uh, you can see I'm wearing like a short sleeve this is okay or you can have a t-shirt that's fine but you cannot have shorts 